Well, we're back. It's day three. Is it? We're in that period of time where time has zero meaning whatsoever. You could tell me it's it's, it's, it's the forty eleventh of uh, February member, and and I believe you. It's just... uh, it's actually the 39th of February, remember? Uh, oh, okay. But you were close. You were close. <laughs> um, but yes, we have entered that weird dead time where retail is hell. Uh, people have no idea what to do. And the TV choices get questionable. Mm-hmm. Is this a questionable TV choice? So far, I'm going with no. No. So we're so here far. to talk about... We're here to talk about Return of the Jedi, and, and, and slight spoiler alert, it, it, it was suggested earlier on that this might be the first point of divergence. This, this might be where you get some juicy podcasting where we violently disagree on, on, a, on a thing. Because, uh, per my insistence, we have been doing the despecialized editions of, of Star Wars, and I think it's safe to say that thus far, with Star Wars and with Empire Strikes Back, a, a more positive experience. But But... Does that change here with Return of a Jedi? Well, here we know. Here is the crossroad stood in front of us. There is the way of the Jedi and the way of the Sith. And which way are we going to go? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> give, give us your top level, top, top level thoughts, top level thoughts Ooh, of this. Top. And how long has it been since you last watched Return of a Jedi? Again, I think I probably last watched this in the run-up to A Force Awakens, but I would have watched the special edition version because that is the mm-hmm. one that I had access to. I have never had access to the original versions before. You've, you've never been able to, to marvel in, in the wonder that is Yub Nub. <laughs> mm, mm, we'll, come, we'll circle back round to Yub Nub. So I do have uh, something that I guess I need to confess, admit uh, to at this point in time. I did a podcast um, Mm -hmm. about redemption art. With the question of, is Darth Vader redeemable? Yes. And I want to elaborate on that at this precise moment in time because I, well, I have always said that Darth Vader is irredeemable. Yes. Based based off of, based off of uh, your knowledge of having seen the prequel um, films as well though you 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 were basically saying you you weren't so much saying is Darth Vader redeemable as in was Anakin Skywalker redeemable I do think that at this point uh Anakin uh uh, well Darth Vader we don't have Anakin in these films and I think that for me is a real takeaway I had it is Darth Vader the whole time the three movies it's Darth Vader I know he takes his helmet off at the end but it's still not Anakin that we're seeing it's still Darth Vader and it very much for me this is Darth Vader this is the story of Darth Vader this is the 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 final good decision he made for his son and for his daughter you know and I think that was you know when the emperor is is killing Luke and says you know well we'll kill this one and we'll go for the daughter you know that clearly was a turning point for him and and I find that quite interesting so Darth I'll say it now Darth Vader in these three movies is a redeemable and redeemed character there you go, folks. You heard it here first. Uh, if, if nothing else, that moment alone was worth a price of admission to this show. We should save this episode to the very end now, so we have to listen to to all of the uh, the episodes before we get to that moment. <laughs> nah, because it's already going out today, so it, it's happening. Oh, okay, um, fine, fair enough. So, so okay, here's, here's a revelation that's, that's, I had. That's my big takeaway from it. There you go. So, what's your big revelation? Da, 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 here's a big da. revelation. So, something that you know, obviously, objectively, was always aware of, but I only just kind of sat down and had the light bulb moment and go, ah, yeah. <laughs> This is two films. This is two distinct films, both with start, middle and end, that yep. are tonally radically different. And the thing, the thing is, you know, I, I think Return of the Jedi from the original trilogy has some of the best moments in Star Wars. The, the, the scenes with the Emperor, anything with uh, the Emperor in, I am here for it because I fucking love how much Ian McDermott just chews every bit of scenery. And, just and so he, you know, nom, I've, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> I've written a line yeah. and it just in capitals on my notes, it just says, fuck me, the Emperor. Oh, yeah. yeah Even he, Yoda he, Neils, <laughs> he's a bad son of a bitch. <laughs> that, that was my only note on the Emperor. <laughs> But I mean, look, look. That is that. That was just some amazing casting. That's really fantastic. But 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 the thing is, and and the scenes when Vader is fighting against Luke, I I, I love all of that. But I've always felt that this one is much more uneven than Empire, and I've I'd always struggled with trying to understand of why, why why was this the case? Why why did I not um, you know really gel with it in in the same way of, of of Empire? And I think it's that. I think it's that you have a 
you know, once again, a Flash Gordon-esque serial, or maybe more of an Indiana Jones-type serial, at the beginning, where they have to rescue Han, start, middle, and end. It ends with them leaving Tatooine, flying off in many different directions. Boom. End, you know, end credits. And then, then there's a intermission where Luke's on Dagobah, and then we come back for the second film, which is once again a war film. And I, it's just one of those things where, yeah, objectively, I've always known that, but this was the first time... I put it into words. I was like, oh, yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it starts with a very kind of Ocean Eleven's heist vibe to me, you know, uh, all the moving parts. And it is, you know, we don't, we, there's several times where we think, oh, no, the good guys have lost. Oh, no, the good guys have lost. Oh, no, the good guys have lost. And actually, no, no, this was Luke's plan all along, you know, and so yeah I think and there's a lot of comedy in that way more comedy than I think I ever remembered you know Han Solo being blind and doing dumb things and R2 bumbling around and there's some quite dark think, points as well but there's, there's I don't some, think the comedy some, lands as well as in Empire though I don't I don't think no it, 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 and I, I don't know if this is down to, to the director. This is uh, directed by Richard uh, Marquand, who I had a moment of going, like, why have I never heard of anything else that he's done? It's a really uh, good reason tried, for that. Well, I was going to say, he, he passed away in 1987 at the age of 49. But um, it, 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 the, the jokes don't end... Qu- the funny moments don't quite land as well as they do in Empire. They're there, and they're still trying to capture some of that magic, but it just doesn't feel... It doesn't feel as organic. In Empire, it feels like a group of funny friends in a very organic sense who are in in these moments. Here, it feels, at least in the first half, it almost feels like a a, a show that's filmed in front of a live studio audience. Like the moment when they're all brought out in front of Jabba and he goes, is that Luke? How are we doing? Same as always. I was expecting the laugh track to just go, ha, 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 ha. I think part of that for me is they changed the writers um, and I wonder if just the writing just didn't gel as well or, you know, didn't didn't work in the same way. Um, and maybe George Lucas had more of a hand in it again. Oh, I definitely think you can feel... The, you, you, you can start feeling the hand of Lucas back on Matilla because the other thing with uh, Irving Kirshner, who directed... Uh, Empire a, a was significantly older, but also had been one of Lucas's teachers when he was at uh, UCL. So, um, or uh, where, where have he studied film? But I, I think because of that, you have an ingrained sense of, of you. You will defer to to him because he knows what he's doing. He taught me. Whereas here, I I think they were much more contemporaries, and so it was easier for Lucas to to perhaps push back on stuff and say, no, we should do it this way rather than that way. I, I have to say, uh, and, and we'll get to the discussion about the end of a the film there, but mm-hmm. I, I think removing the dance number and everything from Jabba's Palace, it makes this so much better because that dance number in the special editions is extremely cringy at this point. It, it's just... It's quite it, uncomfortable. It's, it really is. It's, it is uncomfortable to watch. And, and yeah, look, at this point, you know, it's, uh, what's her name? Snice Noodles is in the background, a barely functioning puppet, but it still fits into the aesthetic of the time of when they are making this um, this film. And and it doesn't take you out of it, whereas the, the bigger dance number that you get in the special editions, it just it stops the movie dead to have this big dance number where they're leaping out of the frame as if it's trying to be 3D. You've got this weird little CGI thing jumping around. As you say, it's just uncomfortable and I am immeasurably grateful that it's not in this version of the film. Um, we will we will come to the end later. It's yes. it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We will come. To, we will come to the end. But we're talking about the first film right now. We're talking about Return of the Jedi Part One. <laughs> we are. Um, <laughs> And again, I, so I think Leia's agency in this is great. Um, for me, that was something that I was really... But again, having watched Empire again, you know, she is, she is a strong commanding woman. She doesn't need a man. She doesn't need rescue. And in fact, she's off to rescue him this time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she walks in in the mask and you don't know it's her. And she's like, yeah, uh, hey. yeah, I, yeah hey. <laughs> <laughs> I want this much money. And he's like this much. She's like, no, no, I've got a big bomb. You'll give me this much. And that whole... Uh, working, you know, within that. And, and I really like that, you know, she doesn't walk in as a damsel in distress. Um, 
Although she, I guess, becomes a bit of a damsel. Uh, well, even toward... she doesn't, does she? she? She, you know, even once she's been captured and forced to put on that bikini, um, you know, she, she, she's, she's not submissive to Jabba at all. You know, she, she's, she's straight up resisting. And she kills it, him. Know. She's the one that kills him in the end. Um, you know, uh, while yeah, they're. All... I mean... A, a, a tragic case of autoerotic asphyxiation gone too far. All, all I want to say, folks, is if you're going to get into that sort of kinky stuff, safe words, consent, and just be aware of your partner, okay? Because it can go, it can go wildly out of control very quickly. So, so it's an important safety. As demonstrated to folks. in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. He was um, into it I, though. You, you could see he was really into it. <laughs> the way until he was wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's. For me, I think it's very important that she is the one that killed him at the end as well. You know, he was her tormentor, mm-hmm. her captor. Um, yeah. We're going to gloss over it at that point. Um, and I think while, you know, the boys are off having their pew pew and laser sword fights um, and kind of making a hash of it from the look of it. I know they're not, but it, it, it looks chaotic. She's just there quietly strangling the boss um, on her own. And mm. I just quite like that, that she's... And then she fires the big guns as well. You know, she she runs across and does stuff. So I think even in her sexy state she isn't an, a lamp you know she gets to do stuff she's 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 active which mm-hmm. I, again i think as a, as a young girl was quite important to see um and definitely as a as a older girl i think still think is important to see i i really enjoyed uh the, the dynamic between r2 and 3po again and and revisiting these films it's, it's just it, it, it strikes me how much more i'm enjoying them now you know when i was younger i i definitely think i found 3po cringy and a bit annoying but here I really appreciate the, the interplay between the two of them. Uh, just, just the way when he turns up to the to the front door sort of thing and he kind of barely taps it. He goes, I don't think anyone's home. Let's go home, R2. And it's like, oh, bugger. Yeah, off we fuck. <laughs> Never mind. Um, and I can completely understand why Luke doesn't bother telling C-3PO the plan, but has clearly oh, told yeah. R2. And it's oh, like, everyone no. Everyone else is in on it except, except 3PO. <laughs> like, you what? <laughs> You're playing the wrong message. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> um, but I think that that works for three PO, um, mm-hmm. uh, and three PO in the second half of the film has purpose again. Three PO is a bit more MacGuffin-y in the second half of the film, I find, um, but that's okay. I think. Well, it's nice that he's able to contribute to to success. You know, R two has always been kind of a key component. You know, being either in the back of the X wing or you know helping unlock the doors and 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 stuff whereas you know in, in empire free people gets blasted and that's that's kind of it uh, whereas here you know it, it's it's and, and, and i love how you have the ewoks kind of you know their worship of him as a god and hans like go well you don't divine powers to get us out of here go, certainly not it's against my programming i just love how utterly proper he is <laughs> it's just really funny well he's meant to be like a british butler isn't he i always think he's based a lot on uh alfred from batman and that kind of style and i think that's a really i think it's quite a well it was a big decision to go in that direction but i think that has really formulated how we see robotic servants as such in kind of science fiction from that point onwards mm-hmm. yeah um, it kind of it set the way oh yeah 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 um i really enjoyed uh it, <laughs> the, the effects obviously I, I think by and large still stand up really well uh, and again I'm talking more about the first bit the stuff with the Rancor is, is great and I appreciate again here that you don't see the Rancor until it's revealed to Luke unlike in the special editions where you, you get a sense of it from um, the dancer falling in there um, and I feel really bad that Luke kills the Rancor I know it's a monster I know it was trying to eat him but it's not its fault you know come on Luke can you, can I you, cried can you maybe... as a kid when they killed it and oh, I mean, still the two guys adult. coming and they're just like oh my pet it's just <laughs> if someone murdered my dog I would be so upset and like yeah that's that's I'm not particularly fond of that bit uh, because I think it is I think I can understand within the space of the film you know Luke is still teetering on that edge of of Jedi and Sith and you know that's very clear because he's now in all black ooh sexy scary all black the bad guys um, so I think it makes sense for Luke to kill the monster, where obviously I think if Luke was more drawn to the light side um, or more firmly in that Jedi space, he probably wouldn't have done. But yeah, it makes me sad every time. Poor Rancor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> poor, poor Rancor. I mean, you know what it is? It's, it's, it's that little last exhale of breath. I, I will tell everyone, though, if it, if it does distress you, there is someone who did a great uh, webcomic 
which shows Duran caught with a big bandage around its head being fed soup by the, uh, the jailer because it wasn't actually cured. It was just it just had a headache. That so, is, I have I, seen that comic and that is what I choose to believe what happens and it's yeah, not that, actually that, dead. It's just bonked no. on the head. Just bonked on the head. So, so I'm taking that as the head cannon there, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoy the first half of the film as, you know, just kind of a, a heisty uh, adventure. It's great how the band comes back together. It's, it's very telling how much more assured Luke is um, compared to well, where we last saw him. He's still in that cocksure, like at the start, in that yeah. whole sequence, he's still very cocksure, which is how we saw him at the, you know, when he went off to fight Vader and Empire. And it's like, oh, shit. Is this? Is he going to make? Is he going to get this wrong? You know, is he making the same mistake we saw him make in the previous film when he thinks he can do it, and he actually can't? And I love the fact that obviously he can do it. You know, this is the four years of training we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. This is this is a difference between half baked Jedi and almost full Jedi Luke. Well, and that's the thing when we see him. You know, you know the, the control that he has there, the, the way he speaks to Bib Fortuna, and, and I love the way he, he he'll kind of like you go, "You will take me to Jabba now," and the way Bib's hand just kind of follows his. He goes, "I will take you to Jabba now." <laughs> you know, you serve your master well. I serve my master well. I I just really really enjoyed that uh, that that sense of who Luke is, and you get a sense of who he has become. Where you do think, you know, actually, if if this was Luke who faced off against Vader in Cloud City, would he have been so utterly owned? Yes, yes, he would have been. But um, but I also <coughs> sorry, I feel no, no, that the Luke we see here is a real combination of Obi Wan Kenobi and Vader. Like I can mm -hmm. feel both those presences within the character of Luke but I yeah. don't feel there's a lot of Yoda in there no speaking of which uh, should, we, should we have a little chat about uh, Yoda going back to Dagobah uh, you, well, know, you said yesterday do you, are we doing Yoda or are we going to talk about Boba Fett first because you know why, why? What, what did he do he he, he, um, he turned up uh Boba Fett, where's Boba Fett smacked him over a thing smacked him to the side of the ship and then fell into the Sarlacc the end <laughs> So the only note I did make on, on, on Boba Fett is, you know how we all hated the Captain Phasma story in the, in the sequels? Well, I didn't, but yes, carry on. <laughs> well, it was, you know, what a waste of a character. But yeah. Captain Phasma is treated in exactly the same way in the sequels as Boba Fett is treated in the prequels. In, in, not in the Phasma, has more, Phasma has more to do in, in the sequels than Boba Fett does in well, the original I mean, <laughs> that is true, but they, they, they fill the same space is my point rightly mm -hmm. or wrongly and that was just something that I have to notice uh, and yeah. before we talk about Yoda because I know that's it, before we depart the 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 start of the film uh, Luke's new lightsaber it's my favourite lightsaber in the whole series you, you can see that this is very much of the influence of Obi-Wan and I know there's a deleted scene where he apparently builds it in Obi-Wan's old house um but, uh, I'm sad that was not left in, but I can understand that that would probably be uh, change pacing quite dramatically. Oh yeah, but I I, mean, it, I where really would it fit? like the green mm. lightsaber. I really really like his green lightsaber, and I love the fact that when he ignites it, it's like oh shit, different lightsaber. Ooh, you know this is one he's built himself, and I think that's something we lose in the sequels is the whole building your own lightsaber. You know you have to make your own lightsaber because um, they all just fucking use uh, Anakin's blue one is just passed around like candy instead rather than yeah, anyone I mean, actually I, making I remember, their own. I, I was extremely excited when we saw the green lightsaber in uh, The Last Jedi, in, in the flashback sequence, to know that it was still there. And that was, that was a, a great little moment, uh, a little nod to But yeah, I, I think we could probably leave Tatooine. I don't really have anything else to say there. It, it's, oh, it's a it's fun... sandy, meh. Oh, yeah. But it's a fun, it's a fun little adventure. Uh, the band's back together. Lando redeems himself. Although I will say Han is very quick to trust Lando considering the last time he saw him, he was being fed into a carbonite machine on Lando's behest. <laughs> well, I guess the question is, when you're frozen in carbonite, do you still remember anything? Is it like, uh, is it, is it like a, the blip from Marvel when you go away and then you're back and you don't know anything of the time in between? Or could he hear everything maybe or, or still, you know, have thought processes? Oh, that'd be fucking terrifying, wouldn't it? I, I choose to believe he was kind of still in there. Not like a Marvel blip, is what I'm saying. Um, oh, I, 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 I think he was just in hibernation, so I, I, I don't think he was he was mulling away. And I just, I, I just think it's a, a long ass tangent, just for the basic point that when when when, um, when when Lando suddenly reveals himself, I mean, if if I'd have been in the position of Han, I'd have probably shot him as well because like you sold me out, you bastard. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. To Dagobah. Dagobah, where yesterday you said. You were not a fan of the Dagobah scenes with Yoda. Correct. 
Is this still the case then? I, I don't have the same uh, connection with Yoda. I think a lot of other people do. Um, I still think... I think Yoda's a bit of a dick in this one. Um, <laughs> well, because he died. How dare you? <laughs> well, no, he's still very like, you know, Luke says, is Vader my father? And the bastard literally just like turns away in bed. and He's like, well, I guess you know, so I'm going to have to tell you. Uh. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, what would, yeah, I, <laughs> what would you do in that situation where you've been hiding this room? You, you, you're literally at the point of death, and it's just like, <sighs> I, I, I'm, I'm just going to die now. I'm just going to, I'm just going to check out. <laughs> I think, I think it's good that we get a final teaching from Yoda. Um, Dagobah was never my favourite stuff. Basically, I like the montage section in Empire, and I love the stuff in the cave. But I'm not a fan of all the the Yoda exposition stuff. I don't know if that's a hangover from a kid and it being the most boring part, because um, it's not you know full of space battles and cool stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's fine. Yeah, I, I, look, I I really enjoy the the the, uh, the bit of Yoda here. I. <laughs> It's it's a testament to Frank Oz and Jim Henson and everything that they can get so much emotion out of um, the, uh, the, the the puppet there, and and yeah, when 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 he dies and he kind of fades away and you know the blanket falls down and the music swells and then you get that moment where Luke looks back at the uh, the little hut and the light goes out. It's just like oh, that's really that's really sad. That's that's just oh. Uh, I think it's I, sad yeah. and I think it's well done and the puppet's amazing and the music's amazing. It just doesn't connect with me in the same way. Um, <laughs> But I think I think it's right to kill Yoda at this point, or to have Yoda die. I think that because that is kind of the end of of that part of Luke's life. He's now trained. What do we think about Obi Wan Kenobi? And what I think is quite genius. Well, what I told you was true from a certain point of view. <laughs> I mean, wow! Again, that is like the Jedi are dicks in this movie. <laughs> but that is that is. Look, I've got to give you credit. That is an amazing way to, to effectively deal with a massive retcon, which was in no way planned from the start, you know, in, in, in that revelation there. That that was just magnificently done. Um, and, and it absolutely holds water. It's great. And it's true. You know, you're going to find that many of the truths we hold dear do depend on your, your point of view. <laughs> I think... Yeah, I, I mean, I know it's a retcon, as you said, um, and we come in, but yeah, Oda, uh, well, just Yoda and Obi Wan both come across as, as massive dicks in this. Like, well, yeah, like, well, that's what I said. That is kind of what I meant, I guess. Like, from my point of view, he's dead because I'm really sad about it, so I have to just pretend he's dead. And obviously, I'm the one that told you. And Yoda's just running away from the problem. I think. <coughs> Yoda running away to, to Dagobah or has run away to Dagobah completely. You know, uh, Obi-Wan has a new mission. It's to make sure Luke is safe on, on the sand planet of Tatooine. And Yoda kind of fucks off into hiding. But again, that's prequel <laughs> knowledge that we don't have. Yeah, uh, and, and, and obviously we will talk about those when, when we get there. Uh, I, I, I guess now that we've finished with the interlude of, of, of that, we can get back to, to the second half of the film or the second movie, as it were. Um, now, this film came out in 1983, originally, uh, and it was six years after Star Wars. I am absolutely amazed at how far the technology has progressed from uh, Star Wars to Return of the Jedi, because let me tell you, e even now, literally 40 years later, the VFX in that final space battle absolutely stand up 100%. I would put them up against any... I'd put them up against Rogue One, any modern science fiction film when it comes to space battles. This is top tier, grade A, spectacular stuff. Zero notes. Carry on. It's amazing. Oh, hundy P. Because, again, from, from, from a certain point of view, from my point of view, what works really well and what I really notice now kind of sitting and properly watching this is the way the cameras move with the... Uh, the ships as they fly mm -hmm. in round upside down and that real kind of and that's a really modern technique of immersion that definitely was not used um, earlier on or in, in kind of this point in time that's something we do now because we have the, the, the computer capabilities to do it and but it felt it felt really quite immersive to be you know as they twist and turned around things and above things and I, I think it just worked really well I think it was a really good way of demonstrating 3D space that they're fighting in which is always really difficult because it's not something we can particularly easy comprehend as we 
do not go into space. Well, also just the sense of speed you get. You really do feel like those fighters are going at breakneck speed. Uh, I, I, I used to have a game called X-Wing Alliance uh, many, many moons ago, w- w- which you could play as the Millennium Falcon during the Battle of Endor. And trying to fly through the, uh, through the second Death Star to, to the reactor, uh, it, it, it was absolutely terrifying. But the speed they're going here and, you know, it, it, it's so absolutely nonchalant. We also see that on Endor as well with the uh, the speeder chase. The, there's something oh, about I love that the speeder visual... chase. That, yeah, I mean... It, 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 the speed of chase, it's a little bit shonkier because, you know, obviously just the nature of the compositing against trees and all this. But that sense of visceral speed, it, it's just, it's amazing. It's so and much danger. fun. Yeah. It, I mean, you really do feel that if they sneeze, they are just going to be plastered along the side of a tree just any second now. I, I, the speed of chase, I think, is still one of my favourites. And actually the whole design of of Endor, I think it is so compellingly and completely designed much like Hoth was with new outfits for the rebels for the imperials uh, new technologies that they're using different ways they're using technology that we just don't necessarily see in modern films in the same way you know mm-hmm. this is this is where we they did have they had a different type of of speeder bike for for this place and this place and i i almost think seeing the speeder bikes in other property other star wars properties later kind of takes away from them a little bit because you know why is it not an adapted version or, or you know that kind of homogenization of equipment which definitely is not a case in these first three movies you know, there's there's very distinct styles and stuff for different places. Um, and I mean, obviously, obviously that, was, that was that was just to be clear, <laughs> that was to sell toys. <laughs> I know why. It doesn't mean I don't love it. No, no, no. It's true. Look, um, it, 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 it was targeted at us, and we fought into it. But yeah, look, I, I get your point, and, and and I agree. Although I will say, I really enjoyed the sequence in the end of season one of The Mandalorian, where you had the two speeder bikers just hanging out there. I thought that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't disagree. It was great fun. Um, but yeah, just the, the the profile of those helmets and the whole the visual style of those biker scouts, uh, biker troopers. What are their official names? Uh, scout troopers, I believe. Uh, Joe will be yelling scout. at us if we got that wrong, but I think it's scout troopers. I know. Well, all I've got in my head is hedge scout because obviously we hedge scout is Joe's uh, uh, biker scout character. Thing, place, name, thing, um, person. Um, so but yeah, I love the speeders. <laughs> I love, I love the rebel kind of camo, and that felt very uh, kind of Vietnam Gulf War again with the the helmets and the ponchos, and you know there was a. Re- I think there was a lot of leaning on uh, real life uh, war and guerrilla warfare for for the Rebel Alliance. Except I do notice Han Solo is just in. A, a coat everyone else has mm-hmm. got ponchos and Han Solo gets no poncho he gets a coat with roost sleeves <laughs> well you know he's the general he's in charge so, so he's allowed to do that um, it, also just a, a complete sidebar but something I noticed it feels like uh, Chewie has been to a salon and, and had his hair done and and it is really kind of you, you see it's it glossy from a moment he's, well it's glossy but he's got like bangs Chewie's got bangs <laughs> I'm not as much of a fan of the co- of the chewy uh, fursuit costume in this film as I was in Empire. It 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 it's it's it's, it's the bangs. Some someone has given chewy bangs in this film and it's it's really distracting to the point where I'm going like did was he just bored in makeup in the morning and they just went we're going to try something new Chewie you're going to love it darling. Is this is this how you're trying to show us time has passed for Chewie? You know everyone else gets a new costume. But with Chewie, we'll give him a different hairstyle, you know. <laughs> so I feel we've danced around them enough uh, before they yub nub yep, dance nub. around us. Echa, yub nub. Yes, Ewoks, <laughs> which for the longest time was the bane of the Star Wars fandom, despite spawning two films and an animated series. Um, which we are not watching, to clarify. No, no, we're, we're, we're not. I, I, I campaigned hard, but uh, but Rachel uh, put her foot down and said, we are not watching Caravan of Courage or the other one. So, uh, so no, we're not doing that. <laughs> I like that, but, or the other one. <laughs> one. Um, but, so, okay then, Ewoks, what are your thoughts? Go, hit me. Um, I mean, the... the earth and colour Care Bears are fine. Um... Because they, they, 
it's difficult. I've never had an issue with them. Again, I saw them as a young child. They are designed for. Me. They were designed for me when I first saw them to to like. Definitely, as an adult, I find them a bit cringy. Um, I find them a bit. Oh, look at the primitive natives that are going to win, um, which I can. I, I could find quite uncomfortable. Um, they they're a strange vehicle to pick. I think. And I'm not sure how tonally they fit with the rest of Star Wars. Obviously, they have they have a huge tonal impact on this film and the second half of this film because they are they're in it from like halfway through. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they were the right decision to make. I get what they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to represent. They're just a strange way of doing it. I love them. I fucking love Ewoks. <laughs> I, I, I went, look, I, I went, as a kid, Ewoks, they were great. You know, they, they were cuddly toys, what have you. I'm pretty sure I had a Ewok teddy bear. I watched the Ewok cartoon show. Then in my teens and my early 20s, you know, when I was a edgy Star Wars fan, oh, Ewoks are stupid. How can the Empire be defeated by teddy bears, you know? An entire legion of his best troops were sent there. Oh, it's so unrealistic. But now, I've got to tell you what, I fucking love the Ewoks. They're perfect. They're hilarious. I'm on board. Just, just listening to them arguing amongst themselves. With uh, we should eat them? No, we should eat them. But, but this one said he'll float. Ah, what does he know? Sort of thing. I, I love the interaction between them. I, I, I love how when you know they have to go and get the guards away from the back door entrance. Sort of thing. That one just goes and sneaks up and just steals the speeder bike and he's just off holding on for dear life. Ah, I think the Ewoks are great. I love them. And and if you say they don't necessarily fit totally with Star Wars. I think the they do or they did fit totally with Star Wars I think what's happened is those edgier Star Wars fans who think that Star Wars should be you know serious grown up sort of uh, or not it should be a serious adult well until you make a franchise. serious grown up movie and then they don't no, no, like no, it once again there's a difference between growing up and adult when you make it something for adults at that point they don't necessarily fit but no I, I, I get why they're in I get the problems but watching it this time I, I had so much fun with the Ewoks I, uh, even the fact that look, like, when, when we get into the um, to the chicken walker sort of thing, and he just start driving it, and I just you know, should we stick in his oh, head? I love goes, that Whoa! bit. It's just yeah, I, I I love the Ewoks, and I love the fact that despite all the technological might that the Empire brings to bear, they only managed to kill one, and I choose to believe that that one also was just taking a nap. <laughs> I assumed it was stunned, to be honest. No, it was just nap yeah. time. It was nap time. <laughs> I, so I don't I, but again I grew up at a time when although I was a child and the Ewoks I thought were cool lots of the narrative around them at the time was they're stupid and they're rubbish and stuff like that I I don't dislike the Ewoks I just again I'm not sure if the, they're totally correct because they're a huge part of the movie I think in my head they're, I always thought they were in it a lot less than they actually are um, so I think it works because of the amount they're in it if they were if they were more condensed in their time period on screen if they had less screen time it'd be different but they do have a lot we do get quite a lot I think mostly my opinion on them is completely swayed and formed by the absolutely god awful fucking Maid Marion dress that they put Leia in for no reason whatsoever well they, they clearly had a, a leftover from uh, someone that they killed previously I think from one of those other two Ewok films um, but, but I can't but recall but it's a god awful dress why did we need to put Princess Leia in a dress what, and, and some weird kind of medieval Arthurian no, I just uh, I, I mean I, uh, I, I, I think you're asking the wrong question I just don't like it I think you're asking the wrong question I think the question here is why did Leia choose to wear it well yeah that's true if we're talking you know? as a characters I yeah. choose to believe that some teddy bears pointed some spears at her and pointed at the dress and pointed at her again and she was like oh shit I guess I'm putting this on oh um, please like she's taking any guff from those teddy bears whatsoever I mean you saw what happened when Wicket tried it <laughs> no no that's true um, yeah, but so, yeah so, my, I, I, I viscerally I, you know I think hate was, the no, dress no you know what I think was going on there they were getting ready for a LARP she was in a costume ready to go and then all of a sudden they turn up with these people who've intruded onto the site so, uh, so that's what I choose to believe what was happening there I like the fact you used the word LARP. Oh, yeah. I know what I did. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, I, I th- that costume I just so hate for Leia. I think mm. it's a real, I think it's a real shame she's putting it at all when she's in she's in trousers for two films, which is really impressive it shouldn't be but you know and we had a sexy moment earlier on i'm just she has a lot of costume changes in this movie which feel frankly quite unnecessary and she goes back in she comes out this dress and then goes back into this fucking dress at the end and i just think it puts her back in that kind of princess space and she's not she's worked hard she's killed and there's the 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 great bit where she gets shot and they get surrounded and she's got a gun hidden and hands like oh yeah baby that's that's the woman i love um and then she shoots people so she's shown to be this really confident and then we put her in a little dress I clearly have a lot of feelings about this one dress that I was really unaware do. of. Uh, I, I really I do. I, I, I can't say I, I had any uh, uh, thoughts of it outside of that, but, um, well, um, on the plus side, you never have to see it again. This is true. <laughs> so, um, uh, that, that, that was Ewoks we've done there, uh, which, you know, I, I, I think they're great. I, I really enjoy... I, even the battle and everything that's going on there, I, I think, is great. Um, you know, everyone always going on about the, oh, how could the um, you know the, the, these primitive e- Ewoks? I think that's a much more uh, problematic conversation to be having than the depiction of them being that way, because there's a, that's a, there's a huge assumption there about the level of technology they, they they exhibit just because they choose to, you know, live in the trees and all that. From what we see, I mean. One of them is able to operate a speeder bike, and two of them are able to operate a walker. So, I mean, there's a level of technological um, ability there, I think. Uh, and the fact that they have these traps all set up, and they've clearly been set up for a while, means they were probably planning to get rid of the Empire on their own for quite a while. So, um, Oh, yeah, I feel this is a calculated plan, and these rebels have just kind of turned up, and it's like, well, sure, fair enough, you can join our plan if you like. Uh yeah, I I don't see anything wrong with the primitive technology or you know the the sticks and stones weapons destroying the what the empire Vietnam? with their all their technological <laughs> might. Well, but it works repeatedly across you know warfare in real life. We see it all the time, and you know the the Romans were beaten by the Vikings because the Vikings just had more numbers and didn't fight in you know nice easy little formations like the Romans did you know it's such a repeated point across history the Australians lost a war to some birds in the emu war the Australians lost to birds and I'm pretty certain those birds did not have AK-47 is all I'm saying (laughs) so I don't I don't have any issue with 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 the I think that's a good theme of the film um you know the ingenuity and friendship overcomes evil and technology, or, you know, e- evil might is mm. basically what it's saying. And that's that's a simple, easy to understand thing. And that's fine. No, no notes. <laughs> uh, so, so we've already touched upon the space battle, which I think is amazing. Uh, shout out to Admiral Akbar uh, for the uh, for the infamous line. Uh, Our cruisers can't repel firepower of that magnitude. Uh, it's a classic. So many memes about that one. Um, got it on a T-shirt and everything. You do. It's there next to the somehow Palpatine has returned one, which segues us nicely to a discussion on my favourite character, I think possibly in all of Star Wars, the Emperor Palpatine. I I fucking love him. I I, I love He's not called Palpatine in this movie, though, is he? No, he's just called the Emperor. Right. I thought I was tripping when I was watching this. I'm like, at no point have they said Palpatine. It's just the um, Emperor. No, that, that, I'm pretty sure that comes out from... It's either in, in notes or it comes in for Phantom Menace when we meet uh, uh, Ambassador or Senator Palpatine. But I, every, every line out of his mouth is, is just... From, from the moment you see him descending the shuttle with his guards in the fancy red pyjamas... And you know he's serious because he's got guys with red pajamas. Uh, every line he's so assured, and uh, he's just—he he is loving this moment. He, he is chewing every bit of scenery. You could not have cast better. As much as I absolutely detest Rise of Skywalker, spoiler alert, I do, uh, or at least I did last time I saw it. But uh, as much as I hate that, I will tell you this: I, I was here for Ian McDermott coming back because I just. <laughs> I, I love his portrayal 
of the emperor. It's so deliciously evil in that in the campiest way possible. He's up there with Ming the Merciless for me. You know that that's the level we're talking. Oh, absolutely! It's there's no there's no seriousness. Well, I mean, you know, there's no kind of deep thoughting, brooding bad guy. You've got Vader to do that. No, no, this is this is maniacal leader um, doing whatever the fuck he wants to rule the galaxy. Love it. No notes. And I think the moment we're intro- the introduction of the Emperor is in terms of cinematography is perfect. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, in the chair. Bond villain esque spinning round in front of the the window. Ah, oh, just it's so good. It's so good. Well, when, when you first see him as well, you know he's so slight in stature, especially next to Darth Vader, who is being deferential to him. Um, but he's so well spoken. You know, he, he he doesn't. You know, he he doesn't sound like what would have been a stereotypical evil villain at, at the time he, he's, he, he sounds quite cultured there you know you can clearly see this sense that uh, you know he has some scarring or, or, or something going on underneath there he's not entirely human the way he's lit as well which I, it, it is a real callback to those kind of 1930s where you have the lights across the eyes where they're shining something they already did it in post what have you um, but it's, it's just it's so de- I, I, I just loved it and the entire sequence when they're trying to turn Luke to the dark side and, and Palpatine is just there heckling away having the time of his life really enjoying it uh, you, know, you know oh you want this don't you take your weapon strike me down and your journey towards the dark side will be complete oh it's so good <laughs> And I think it has, as I said, I've, I've called him a Bond villain before, but he does have that kind of 1930s uh, evil, that Ming the Merciless, that Bond. It's, it's such a, for such a small amount of screen time that that character actually gets. And, you know, we don't really hear much about the Emperor until this movie. We sort of think Darth Vader is kind of top of the shop. And then you find, oh, no, there's a bigger, scarier guy. Oh, oh no, wait, he's not actually that big and scary. Holy shit, he's super scary. He has lightning fingers. Well, remember, but he's we not see, very big. We, we do. It, we, we do see the, the hologram in uh, Empire, which originally uh, was played by a woman mm. and they'd replaced the yep. eyes with those of chimpanzees. And I've got to tell you, kind of terrifying. I, I still think that that works better than actually just having Ian McDermott in there. But because it's such a giant projection there and everything, you know, it, it has a sense of presence. It's not what you expect when you see him in this film. No. Um, my only thought on that is they could have been a bit more um, useful, more kind of film noir, you know, and, and not show the Emperor in quite the same way. But that's that's fine. That's it's small. I can cope. But yeah, this is our first introduction to the Empire and it's uh, to the Emperor, and it's a you know we don't we don't get a huge amount with him until the end, but his presence is felt across the entire thing. Love it. Clearly, the big theme of this film is trying to lure Luke to the dark side, and. I know we're perhaps getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. In fact, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but, you know, this is a discussion that will come up later. I think that this film and the portrayal of Luke in that final battle, what, face down with Vader, where he loses control at the suggestion that he might lose Leia to to Vader and the dark side, and the way he, lose, he, he gives in to his anger and his hate, and he goes... I mean, he, he absolutely devastates Vader... You know, com- compare and contrast Luke versus Vader in Empire to to this moment here, where you can see that his hate has made him powerful. It has given him the power to defeat Vader. Look at that, and then look at that moment in The Last Jedi, where he relates about how when he looked into Ben's heart and he saw what happens, and he lost control, and it terrified him. It terrified him he went back to that well. Tell me that that doesn't absolutely track for that character. Uh, it's re-watching it now. I always remember that he lost his temper, but the way he does it and uh, it's just, it's good. And I think for me, this is the bit when, v- this is the moment Vader decides he's going to redeem himself. I, I don't know well, how to explain this, that. This in moment, a, it, as he's getting wailed upon by his son. Going, no, no, but, no, but he no. doesn't. <laughs> but I think, I don't think Vader puts his all in to fight Luke in the first place or he starts to and then backs down Luke is losing it and the Emperor is saying yes yes feel the hate and I think that for me I very much interpreted that as Vader seeing the Emperor the Emperor controlling Luke in the way he did 
Anakin um, and not wanting his son to not wanting his son to go this so he he backs down he stops he won't fight his son um at that point and i think i think it's masterfully choreographed performed the music and oh my god the, uh, the music here ah john williams take a fucking oscar and take a bow this this here i, I mean i mean that call bit as well where you know he, he's just hammering away with him I, I mean for my money i think the moment when he did when he decides he can it's not too late he can be redeemed is when he's seen his son give in to the dark side he, he's seen his son give in to his hate and then step back it's it's after he chops his hand off and he sees in that moment that oh he's got a robotic hand i've got a robotic hand he remembers back to the cave he remembers seeing himself in darth vader's thing and at that moment instead of accepting what vader and the emperor and everyone has prescribed as his destiny as you, you know even Luke said, once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. And that is true. It will forever dominate him, his destiny. But it doesn't mean he has to give in to it. And, you know, he, he, he says, no, I'm not doing that. And he throws the, the lightsaber away. That's the moment I think Vader realises that, oh, so I didn't actually have to go and murder all of those kids after I killed Samuel L. Jackson. Ah, this is awkward. <laughs> I think Vader is shown the path that he didn't travel. I think mm -hmm. you're right. I think it's masterful. And yeah, but I think again, watching these films, in and I have to stress that it's in isolation of the original versions of these films and just the three as, as a set of movies that they are, Vader has a, has a redeemable arc and that is his moment of, of ceasing to become Vader and choosing to become Anakin, I guess. Um, or the Anakin we know uh, based on these three movies. If you include the prequels, then Anakin's a dick and kind of irrelevant to, but does that make sense you know you're taking the, the yeah, yeah. just these three <laughs> movies um as as a standalone which they always were and were always meant to be and george lucas yeah. was just like yeah yeah there's uh, there's more movies there there's prequels yeah 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 there's loads um the, 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 what, once again uh the, the moment when you know the emperor you know realizes that he's you know he's failed luke isn't going to turn and you know he's just like so be it Jedi, you know, such hate spat on the word Jedi, mm. but then just starts torturing Luke, uh, and it is torture. He's doing it for his gain and enjoying it. Well, and it's not, it's not a, a Star Wars movie without a good heavy dose of torture. There's a lot of torture in this movie. We didn't talk about the the droids being tortured at the start of this movie, but Star Wars likes a good little bit of torture. Oh yeah, there, there was there was a lot of that going on there. But but here you see, and, and Luke pleading with his father, and the biggest crime I feel in the special editions. Uh, and it's only the most recent version of a special editions is you have this moment where Vader looks to his son, looks to the emperor and wordlessly silently decides no and, and takes agency and picks up the emperor and throws him down the, the hole. And what they added in the last um, iteration of these films is now Vader says, no, no. And I have to tell you, it robs that moment of so much power. It, and it's all in the service of a callback to something which came later where they have Vader say but no when he becomes Vader at the end of Revenge of the Sith it, it an absolute travesty and I wanted to ask you a question here specifically we've, we've established that the director of this film um, Richard Marquand died uh, in 1987 all of the changes being done here have been done by George Lucas and while yes Lucas' story he's the producer of this but they're not his films I really feel that, okay, Star Wars, you directed that, you know, for, for, for me, yeah, largely, director is king. with your own movie, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. It feels like all the changes that have been done to this film, they're not Lucas's film. This was Richard Markham's film, and it really, I, 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 it makes me really uncomfortable with those sort of tweaks and changes there. We'll get to Yudna, but I'm, I'm talking specifically about this moment here. <laughs> Because it robs it of so much power. I I think you're right. I think George Lucas has a a habit of going and robbing uh, moments of cinematic beauty for narrative. Well, not even narrative clarity. Narrative retroacting changes. Um, but I think you're right. I think it's an absolute travesty that they 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 added dialogue over this bit because it is it's powerful and it is what it is and it's so revenant of other films where you know the stoic 
that heroic stoic moment and i think again i think it's more a redeemable point that he doesn't say thing i think adding the no robs some of that redeeming feature of darth vader um as a child it feels performative I, it feels performative because it feels like i mean the only person you're saying no to in that moment is luke mm. It just it doesn't add anything, and I think I think it damages the 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 quality of the film by having it in there. Um, mm. As a child, this bit terrified me uh, because you could see the skeleton in oh, Darth yeah. Vader. <laughs> um, uh, the same way that the two skeletons in A New Hope terrified me because you know I was I was, I was six, <laughs> um, and they were terrifying. Um, but obviously, I I appreciate the the again the the choice to do that, and it's difficult to do. Um, I am going to say something that's possibly controversial. Okay. I completely think it's open-ended as to whether the emperor dies there when he's just thrown down. It's I, and I'd sort of forgotten how ambiguous it is because we saw Luke fall a similar distance in cloud city and survive with less control of the force Mm -hmm. the nothing's happened to the emperor he's not been hit by a lightsaber there's been no he's not been attacked he's just been picked and thrown he was using a large amount of the force in his lightning energy so i'm not sure i'm not sure why we'd think that would kill him it would move him away um but i say this in full knowledge that that means i'm almost giving credence to somehow palpatine returned (laughs) which is absolutely what i am not doing i just think that is the the, the thing with that is my issue with that and we, we, we will litigate this when we get to that moment it's not the bringing back of palpatine it is the way it is done in in such a slapdash manner yeah my point is in in the uh, comics uh dark empire comics palpatine returns in those comics and i'm not advocating one of those people saying over oh, eu was so much better they should have just stuck with that but i'm just saying it was done in such a way that it didn't make me go huh no that doesn't make sense i mean you see when they throw the emperor down in, in, to, into the um into the trench and this huge uh, amount of energy which is then expelled blasting up into the thing and we know from what we've seen with uh obi-wan and with um yoda that you know force users are luminous beings as it were i always just took that to be the emperor's spirit or whatever you want to do escaping because in the very nature of what we star wars films are you know he would return at some point in the future in a, a as yet to be you know seen thing you know it, it didn't once again it didn't necessarily feel like that was the end it, it was a an end for this moment and this trilogy but not necessarily end to the emperor so so throwing him down the uh, to the shaft i never really felt that that was it we would never hear from palpatine again agreed i i i can't say it better than you just have so i'm just yeah agree i okay. think the way they did it in the sequels is the problem um mm. not that he returned at all and yeah yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with the theory of him returning based on the way we see it. if if darth vader had taken luke's lightsaber and cut the emperor down the way he cut down obi-wan and then thrown him over the side i'd be like yes yeah, a pretty definitive death at that point but it's not that he just picks him up and throws him with it, it's it's and i think again without the no on top of it it's far more get away from me you know i'm choosing to consciously uncouple from you rather than die um that's that again that's my interpretation of that piece um and it's great and then yeah. obviously luke luke drags his father uh, i must drag him a long way <laughs> Yeah, like, and I love the fact no one stops them either. No one stops the the person they've been searching for for five years, uh, uh, you know, dragging dragging Lord Vader around. I, I mean, at that point, I, it, it definitely seems like they have much bigger problems given that the uh, the reactors in, in, in a moment of overload there. Um, what I do f- want to touch upon, though, is, is that moment when they do remove vader's helmet and, and we see anakin for the first time i i remember this terrifying me you know and and, and it being really sad as well because you know when, when you know for, he takes it off and you know vader is going to die and this is a bad guy and this is a monster we know this is a monster but i still remember feeling very sad that 
they were taking the helmet off with the knowledge that that would kill him. And you see underneath it, it's not this scary monster. It's just a broken old man. Uh, and and <laughs> uh, it's a silly little note. Narratively beautiful. But I, it's narratively beautiful. A silly little note. <laughs> Which, again, I had never really noticed until watching it this time. They digitally removed his eyebrows in the special edition. <laughs> Of course they did. Why would you not? <laughs> oh, George. Oh, you crazy motherfucker. Uh, but I really like that moment where, you know, just that let me see you once with my own eyes and tell your sister you were right. It's it's a touching little final moment there. And, and yeah, we're going back again to this whole thing. In that moment, Vader is redeemed, I feel. In, in, in that moment, he, he has earned his... Um, his redemption he's connected with his son uh and yeah luke has rest- connected and back the with the yeah. good bit of the force mm-hmm. yeah so no, uh, notes. So, no notes really really enjoyed that um once again the whole space battle sequence is just it, it's it's so exhilarating watching all of that stuff i still love <laughs> the moment when that one a wing you know gets hit sort of thing and and, and the, uh, Admiral Piet's going like intensify the forward batteries. I don't want anything getting through. Go, it's too late. <laughs> it's Admiral batteries. And just that one ship going into the bridge and that entire Star Destroyer goes up like a Roman candle. It's just fucking hilarious. I love it. It's beautiful. It. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I also think uh, something. <laughs> I really like seeing uh, the space battle through the Emperor's window as well in the distance. You know, that yeah. real kind of removal from Luke and what they the battle they were having and the the space battle i mm-hmm. thought that was really a really nice um I, I thought that was a really interesting way to connect the two scenes together you know in terms of narrative and place them together but also to really show like oh yes that's your friends dying unnecessarily i wanted to touch upon <laughs> up that moment as well a little bit because uh, an interpretation that i came watching it this time so so there's that moment when Luke finally gives in, grabs his lightsaber and goes to strike down the Emperor. Yeah. Now, one of the things yeah. that we ha- hear Vader saying, especially in Empire, is if, if Luke joins him, together they can defeat the Emperor and rule the galaxy as father and son. But what you have here is it, Vader could have let Luke take the, sw- take the swing, basically. You know, I, don't, I don't think there's anything in that moment the Emperor could do except expect Vader to stop the lightsaber hitting him, but he doesn't. I don't think in that moment Vader is doing that to protect the Emperor. I think subconsciously, perhaps, Vader's doing that to stop his son falling completely to the dark side. Yes, which is how it adds to his redemption, because mm-hmm. it's not just about stopping him, it's about preventing his son from becoming like him and yeah. that yeah that all feeds into it for me mm-hmm. on this isolated three film arc <laughs> <laughs> yes yes um, only only in this in, uh, re- reading of a film so uh, you, st- you start adding other stuff it will it will change that reading somewhat <laughs> um yeah i love i love the emperor dying like i i've written in my notes the emperor dies like an evil old wizard in a fantasy film and he does mm-hmm. ah, yeah. down the um Oh, it's up there with, I'm melting, I'm melting, I'm melting. Oh, it really wow. is. <laughs> um, so leaving the Death Star behind, we've blown it up. Yes. We're back on Go Endor. We're, back on Endor. Yeah, we're in, the, we're in the final. There's a scene on Endor which I love um, that I totally forgotten existed um, in Star Wars. And that the was the... Uh, no, it's the he's my brother scene. Um, oh, so that's so weird. <laughs> no, I love it. I love that Han's like, uh, so Luke, you love him. And she's like, well, of course I love him. And Han's like, it's okay. I'll stay tonight. Then I'll be out the way. I, you know, I wish you good luck. Thank you very much. Um, you know, obviously I don't want it to be weird, but thank you. It's like, <laughs> and then she's like, because it's my brother. And he's, and then they kiss and his recollection and just in my head all he's thinking is oh she kissed her brother <laughs> just I love it as a little scene I think it's great I think it really shows the two characters really well um, and their relationship and kind of the footing of it and yeah I just it was it's small and I love it and yeah, it just made me laugh I, I, I just think in that moment when, when she says he's my brother and, and, and I think the thought process going through Han's head is since when? <laughs> Like, when did you receive this information? Well, yeah. 
please be after they kiss. Please be after they kiss. Please be after they kiss. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, what, 90 second scene. I just really like it. I think it's a really, it's a good way of, of getting the fact that Luke and Leia are related, you know, in into the, it fits into the wider context of the story really nicely. It's like well thought out jigsaw pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And uh, uh, yeah, the pie, <laughs> the pie is nice. As yeah. as nice as a funeral pyre is, uh, it, music it gave swells, me a it's kind of, it's, yep. it, and uh, you know Luke standing there stoically as the corpse of his father goes up, and uh, and uh, all that plastic melting, polluting the atmosphere. <laughs> Oh, I, I think Endor has much bigger problems coming. Or maybe not, because as we, as, as we know from the sequel trilogy, the, the, the remains of a Death Star didn't land on Endor. They landed on a another planet. Uh, but uh, again, we will get Somewhere to that else. in the fullness of time. Okay, we put it off long enough. We, we need to talk about Yub Nub. <laughs> Do we, though? Do we actually? So... Uh, one of the biggest changes in, in, in uh, Return of the Jedi is the final sequence. In this version, uh, we have the Ewoks performing uh, the, the all-time classic that is Yub Nub, uh, and we get views of people Christmas dancing number around. Christmas one as, material right there. It, look, I'm, I'm pretty sure it could have been Christmas number one, but you see the X-Wings flying overhead with all the, uh, the, um, the fireworks going off. We get Luke looking over as Ghost Obi-Wan, Yoda appear, and then age-appropriate uh, Ghost of Anakin, uh, also as played by Sebastian Shaw, uh, and, and then it ends. Now, in the special edition, we get a montage sequence, a different song, and we get a montage of um, various places throughout the Star Wars galaxy. There's Cloud City, there's Tatooine, there's Naboo, there's Coruscant. Coruscant. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, you, you have told me off air that you have thoughts about this final uh, moment. So, so, so I, I see the floor to you, Rachel. Give us your thoughts. Yub Nub sucks. Um, I think it is tonally wrong for the end of this epic trilogy. I think it's too localised. It's too small. This is meant to be they've destroyed the Empire, not won the battle. They're parting as if they've won the battle if we keep it all on that one planet in that one space. I think... Yeah, I think it's too small and local. That kind of partying would have been fine at the end of A New Hope because they've won the battle, but there is still war to fight. But they've won the war at this point, or that's what we're supposed to believe, based on these three movies in their entirety and no other media connected to them. And I think the, I think the music's wrong tonally. I think it's wrong. I don't think it's a bad piece of music. I just don't think it has the gravitas Star Wars deserves for the end of the epic saga of of you know the most important saga to have been told on film ever. It's just tonally incorrect. So that said, I'm not equally much of a fan of the specialised versions either. I think the song is much better. I think the song is tonally more appropriate. And I like the idea of going to other planets and seeing other things, but I do not think they necessarily pick all the right places. I think Cloud City makes sense, but I think we should have gone to other planets from the original from from this trilogy, basically. Why didn't we go to Tatooine? You know, there's there's other places <laughs> They didn't did go to Tatooine. We? Yes. It, just, it didn't look a lot like Tatooine when I watched it's, it. It's literally Moss Eisley. <laughs> it's just not a very well-known shot of Moss Eisley. It's not... But again, the problem is it's a Moss Eisley shot based on the prequels, not based on this trilogy of films. This sequence is very strange. And it's, I, I think this sequence is, is perhaps, perhaps emblematic of a problem that you have with how Star Wars has been presented to us. Because... You're right. Yubnub does not necessarily show the end of the war. But I don't necessarily think at the end of this trilogy of films it was supposed to be the end of the war. The Emperor is defeated, the Death Star is gone, but that's not the end of the Empire. Once again, it, it, it's the end of this moment, this battle they have won there. You know, And, and I quite like, look, I, I grew up here with Yubnub, so I will always have a soft spot, spot in my heart for it. Um, and, and, and that's great. Now, once you get the prequel trilogy there as well, and the special editions, then yes, that version works as the end of a saga because it very much feels as it is in that moment, but it is the end of a war. It is the end of an epic six-part saga. That feels quite definitive as an end. You know, you've gone back, you've visited other places, tyranny's been overthrown, we're at the end of history, all is right in the world. But then when you add on the sequel films... 
now it feels really out of place because when you see what comes later on and what we get at the end of Rise of Skywalker is not as impactful. So we're in this weird situation where the ending, the, the official current canon ending, which we get in the special editions, is too... Um, it, it's far too... Um, it, 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 it's a good end to the saga, whereas the one that we get with Yadnab, I think, works better in as the sixth film in a nine film sequence, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Uh, I think I think we just need to say I think it should have always been the original uh, Darth Vader rather than Hayden Christian at this point. I think regardless yes. of what version you're looking at, they should never have change the the actor for the force ghost at the end um i'm not really sure vader should ever be a force ghost but that feels like a different uh, a different conversation um and something i'm not going to touch on now because you know time is we're not really that we've, we've done it before but uh, yeah so I, I i think exactly so yeah i think Yovnov doesn't work for me that sequence doesn't work it's too long it's as you say it's a battle win not a war win and I always felt like the rebels at this point felt they'd won the war um I hate Leia's fucking dress so much um (laughs) (laughs) and I think yeah I think the I, I don't know I just I don't know how I'd make it better or, or more tonally fit. I think the music change, I think actually if you just had the music change, you'd probably be fine and maybe cut it down a little bit because it's a little bit long um, for what it is. So change the music and cut it down and that's probably okay. I do like the idea of going to other places, especially Cloud City, which, you know, we we get very clear hints that it's, you know, a now Imperial, you know, garrison is there rather than, you know, the free space it was before. I like the idea of going to Tatooine. It would have been nicer if it was a different shot of Tatooine rather than such a prequel heavy shot. But again, that's as part of a six arc rather than a three arc. Um, And I think it would have been nice to maybe see some other rebel bases rather than imply that all the rebels have landed on this one moon which feels like a really bad idea um but you know maybe see some inside some rebel ships where people are partying or cheering or kind of making that wider galaxy feel which i think is missing at the end with yub nub okay well there you go that's the most controversial take i think we can take away from here is that uh, i like yub nub and rachel has no soul so um <laughs> i'm okay with that I'm okay. Uh, so that does leave us to only say one thing. The originals are over, and now it is the time of the prequels. Oh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, yeah we, we are, yes, a, a, a new darkness rising uh, and all that stuff. Let us, let us go and find out how, how Darth Vader was a sad little boy on Tatooine. Um, yeah, um, we, we will endeavour to, uh, to keep uh, the, the, the next ones uh, under an hour, but I, I feel Mission Creek might come in because I think we have more to say about the, the upcoming films than perhaps we did about uh, this trilogy. What are you talking about? Trilogy, I was a I'm... child and I loved them all. I, I, I will say, revisiting this trilogy, I've enjoyed, I'm glad we've done it. I have really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed going back to the ones that I grew up with as a child as well, as opposed to the special editions. I know you have a different experience with them and I, I appreciate you joining me on, on this little nostalgia trip there, which has been a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I, I, I honestly, I would be absolutely fine if that was it, if we had those three Star Wars films and nothing else. I don't feel that, as, as much as I love The Last Jedi, as much as I love The Mandalorian and Ahsoka, I am kind of fine with this three being it. Um, it. They felt like they were something special, like a glimpse of a wider world that we would never get to see. But uh, that's not the way of the world. And so uh, tomorrow when we come back, we're going to do The Phantom Menace. And I'm sure that's going to be fun. Episode one, Phantom Menace. Join, join us tomorrow if you don't have anything to do in this weird uh, time when there is nothing to do because there is nothing to do. Uh, and, and Or we you're will, randomly uh, listening in the future and you're very confused by our Christmas words. Absolutely. Uh, also, uh, again, going forward, everything we're going to watch going forward, we're just going to be watching what's the current release. So whatever's on Disney Plus or whatever's on your D- DVDs or Blu-rays, I don't think there's been substantial changes really. So yeah, uh, you don't have to worry about if it's not special editions or what have you. We're just watching The Phantom Menace. So yes, that is tomorrow. Misa, so excited. <laughs>